Good evening. I'm Todd Fanzler, welcoming you to the finale of our Spring 2022 Caring for Creation webinar series from Bethel Lutheran Church. In a moment, I'll introduce tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Tracy Holloway. But first, to help us have a lively discussion, we want you to submit your questions and comments during Tracy's presentation. Just type your comment or question using Zoom's chat feature. On my laptop, there's a chat button to click at the bottom center of the screen. On an iPad, the chat button's probably in the upper right corner. When you click the chat button, please select the option to send your comment or question to everyone. And don't forget to click the Enter key. Tonight, just after Mother's Day, we have as our guest speaker one of the founders of the Science Moms, a recently formed nonpartisan group of distinguished atmospheric scientists who, as the name implies, are also mothers. In Tracy's case, two sons, ages two and 12. In her day job, Tracy is a highly regarded professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences at UW-Madison and in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. She also leads a national team for NASA to link so satellite data with air quality and health. She earned her bachelor's degree in applied math at Brown and her PhD in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at Princeton. And she joined UW-Madison in 2003. Tracy, we're delighted to welcome you tonight. Thank you so much, Todd, and uh, thank you so much for everyone at the Bethel Lutheran, Lutheran community for uh, inviting me to speak. It's really an honor to be part of this lecture series. And I'm gonna share my screen and kick us off and I welcome questions uh, at any point. I'm not sure if I'll be able to see them in the chat, but if I don't, then we will follow up um, during the Q&A at the end of this um, presentation. So uh, for a long time, I've been a scientist and for the past 12 years, I've also been a mom, but normally I really keep those two sides of my life quite separate. Uh, one involves lots of computers and data and being very authoritative, and the other one involves being as sweet as possible, making dinner, and making sure everyone is safe and happy. So uh, in 2020, when I was approached to join a group forming the Science Moms program, at first I hesitated because I wasn't sure what it would feel like to take these two sides of my life and bring them together. But actually it's been incredibly rewarding and really exciting to be part of this large national initiative and to feel uh, in some sense, like my full being is being brought to the table where I can care about my kids and their future and through the lens of the work I do uh, every day. And so I'll be talking to you a little bit about the Science Moms program um, and inspersing in some of my own research and perspectives um, as well. And during the Q&A, we can cover anything I talked about or anything I didn't talk about that you wish I had. So the Science Moms um, organization, as Todd mentioned, is a nonpartisan group of mothers who work in climate science. And we are really um, excited about this outreach initiative to um, engage moms in solving the climate problem. And I'll lay out this approach um, that the Science Moms program has taken, but I just, you know, I was brought in by my friend, Catherine Hayhoe, who some of you uh, may have come across her work. She's featured in the upper left um, corner. Um, and Catherine asked if I wanted to join this new program. And in fact, most of the moms in the program are collaborators who I have worked with in the past or gone to graduate school with or cited their work or done other um, projects together. We span uh, Texas and Colorado, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, Arizona. So um, it's really a group of well-established um, colleagues. And um, this, I think, is a new challenge for all of us. 
the mission of the Science Moms program um, is really to reach uh, mothers and to engage this major um, segment of our society who makes decisions all the time related to the future and harness their energy into um, this big issue of climate change. And research has shown that moms care a lot about climate change, but there haven't before been resources targeted toward making this complex science and somewhat partisan and um, controversial um, discussion context relevant to moms um, and their busy lives and the way that they want to engage with material. So our uh, approach has been to share the facts, frame the problem as a solvable problem, um, connect it to things moms care about, especially the future of our kids, and laying out tools uh, to take action. So this uh, initiative emerged from work um, of the Potential Energy Corporation, and I'll tell you about them in just a moment. Um, but they found that 70% of Americans are at least somewhat to very concerned about climate change, but only 14% of them discuss climate change often. And if there's no conversation, if we're not talking about an important topic, then it's really hard to take action and move the ball forward. So um, in 2019, um, John Marshall and Dan Schrag founded the Potential Energy Corporation and started working with marketers and advertisers, researchers, focus groups to really um, hone the best available marketing tools to address this global problem. And um, they have a few different platforms going, but the Science Moms program is the largest activity of the Potential Energy Corporation. And the goals um, of the program are really, you know, twofold, is to, to change the story, to be more resonant with audiences, and reach new audiences that might not have been reached by the existing climate outreach and education activities. And their program identified suburban moms as a particularly valuable audience with the power to change the narrative. Moms make a lot of household decisions. Moms are thinking about the future every day. And um, uh, many moms have uh, uh, are open to new information and having it shape their views. So the campaign has focused on areas with uh, moderate voters and suburban clusters. And actually Madison is one of their focus areas. So, you know, I, I always like to be upfront when talking about the Science Moms program because I'm really proud to be part of it, but it is bigger than just a grassroots initiative started by a couple of moms. There's a lot of horsepower behind the communication and marketing side. And in fact, the $10 million investment in Science Moms um, is the second largest public outreach initiative on climate change, second only to Al Gore's um, outreach um, uh, a few years ago. So one of the examples of the changing the language and making the message clearer um, has come from, you know, simple things like how we talk about climate change. And, you know, I'll confess, I'm a scientist, I'm teaching students, I'm giving academic talks. So I, these uh, lessons learned have not become second nature to me. Um, but, you know, this idea that instead of just saying warming, which sounds pretty good, saying overheating, which sounds not so good, and focusing on pollution rather than emissions and extreme weather rather than a changing climate. And, you know, I'll say as a scientist, I stand behind these, these words. This is a fair characterization. And that's where, you know, we have been very involved at every step all of us science moms in reviewing the material that goes into the marketing and making sure that it does um, uh, comply, uh, align with what we know about the science. So none of us, anytime things seem a little bit exaggerated or a little bit untrue, then we're like, well, hold off. You know, you this is our reputations that you're um, working with. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's neat to be pulling together the science and the outreach expertise together. So um, the Potential Energy Corporation found three messages that really work with moderates, who is the, the target demographic. And one, focusing on kids' futures, and this idea that the number one reason that moderate moms care about climate is for our kids. And Todd mentioned that I have two boys myself, Henry, who's two, and Peter, who's 12. And so Henry was born in 2020. And, um, uh, you know, when I think about climate and all the plots that I've seen and the analyses that I've been part of over the years, oftentimes we talk about 2050 and 2100. And these have always seemed like these far off, you know, markers of the future. But now when I think of 2050, my little Henry will just be 30 years old. It suddenly makes this future time and these future projections seem very immediate. These are going to be shaping my kids' futures in, in the very foreseeable future. So, um, you know, I think that as a mom myself, this idea that like linking it to what we're already planning for our kids um, makes a lot of sense. They also found that um, informing um, the public and the audiences about the basics of climate change, that a lot of people have misunderstandings about the level of scientific consensus on climate change, um, the things we know, the things that we are sure of. And, you know, I've been trying to, you know, make that part of my own um, edu education um, uh, teaching work at the University of Wisconsin, uh, public talks um, for 20 years. And so this idea that, you know, it, it makes me feel good that actually like just sharing the facts is a powerful part of getting the message out about climate change and empowering people to engage with this issue. And the third um, point is just making the link between human activities, the pollution they cause, and climate change. And so this comes back to my own work, which has been focused on air pollution um, since I was a graduate student. And the primary type of pollution that I work, look at in my day-to-day -day research are chemicals in the air that affect public health, that damage agriculture and plants, that impair visibility. And um, these are already regulated in the US under the Clean Air Act. But the same sources that create health damaging air pollution also creates climate damaging pollution. And so, you know, tying the climate conversation back to pollution is something that is very much in my own wheelhouse and something that we'll be coming back to throughout this talk. So the, um, you know, latest initiative of the Science Moms campaign has been really focused on actions and initiatives. And they launched this What to Do uh, You as a way of teaching moms uh, what to do about climate change. And um, there's a great video with uh, my colleague, Joellen Russell, um, laying out how moms get stuck doing everything anyway, so why not solve the climate problem? And uh, boiling it, uh, they boiled it down into these three to-do items. Um, and I'll step you through these and kind of expound on them a little bit from my own perspective. Um, first is to swap, two is to share, and three is to speak up. And um, when we're talking about swapping, um, they're focused on polluting stuff for clean stuff. So if you're getting a new car, think about getting an electric vehicle. If you're getting a new stove, think about uh, electric stove instead of natural gas. And when you're thinking about where to get electricity, um, purchasing it from clean sources. And here in Madison, uh, Madison Gas and Electric has um, programs to opt in to get clean electricity, or at least they've been having those in the past. And they've announced that they're moving toward net zero um, energy by 2050 as well. So, this idea that we want to be moving toward electricity and then moving electricity toward clean sources is a pretty well-established approach to um, reducing the carbon footprint of our day-to-day -day activities. And this is where I'm going to take a little bit of a detour from the Science Moms um, message 
and connect it back to with some of the research that I'm doing in my own lab at the University of Wisconsin. And I mentioned that the same sources that emit carbon also emit um, health damaging air pollution. And when I'm talking about this kind of air pollution that we already know is a real problem, uh, some of it we can see, like what you see here is from the Salt Lake Tribune just three days ago, they had an unhealthy air pollution episode that wound up in the newspaper. Um, the photo I think was taken uh, last December, but actually Salt Lake City has so many bad air pollution days that, that um, it is in the news quite a lot. In fact, most cities in the United States and around the world sometimes have unhealthy air pollution. When you can see it like this, it is um, a type of pollution called fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. And there are also invisible gases, um, some of which cook up in the atmosphere to form PM 2.5. So one of the questions that I've been working on with students and researchers in my group from different perspectives is to try to quantify if we did the kind of swapping out that the science moms are talking about, electric vehicles, clean energy sources. Uh, we know that that will reduce carbon emissions, but what will it mean for these kind of chemicals in the air like PM 2.5? And um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, PM 2.5 now, and then uh, take you into some work that we've just, it's hot off the presses, it hasn't even been published, um, uh, focused on Madison and funded by Madison Gas and Electric to evaluate how some of these swapping strategies are affecting our air here at home. So these uh, fine particulate matter is really the like public enemy number one when it comes to air pollution. They're tiny particles uh, and the 2.5 refers to the idea that they're 2.5 microns or less in diameter, so many times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. And they can enter the bloodstream and cause respiratory or cardiovascular uh, disease, and it's the number one air pollution pollutant associated with um, decreased life expectancy, um, as well as a wide range of other health impacts. And I should make the point that the work I'm presenting here is from my graduate student, Clara Jackson, who just defended her master's thesis this week. So one big difference between PM 2.5 and carbon dioxide, the climate gas, is the, how long it stays in the atmosphere. When carbon goes into the atmosphere, it stays in the atmosphere for up to 100 years. So whether we reduce air pollution emissions here in Madison or in Miami, Indiana, or India, it doesn't really make a difference because it stays in the atmosphere for such a long time. But all of the health relevant pollution from these same sources stays much closer to home. These gases and particles only stay in the air for hours to days. So if we reduce um, emissions here in Madison, we're going to have the biggest benefits here in Madison too. These local health and air quality benefits of the same swapping that's solving the problem, the climate, um, uh, moving us in the right direction on climate. So PM 2.5 varies by city, state, and neighborhood. Here's a map from the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation showing daily average PM 2.5 by county. But even within a county, it can vary from street to street and neighborhood to neighborhood. So the sources of PM 2.5 are varied, um, but one thing to keep in mind is that while you can think of smoke from a barbecue or windblown dust as one type of PM 2.5, other PM 2.5 is cooked up in the atmosphere with emissions of NOx from transportation, sulfur dioxide from coal-fired uh, power plants, nitrogen oxides from a wide range of sources. All of these contribute to that fine particulate matter that is so bad for us. The good news is that the same sources that emit carbon dioxide also, um, uh, if we reduce them, can make our air cleaner and healthier. And as an example, transportation currently is responsible for around uh, 25 to 30% of our carbon dioxide here in the United States. And transportation is responsible for over 50% of our NOx. And electricity is responsible for about a quarter 
of our carbon emissions, and it's responsible for a similar amount of NOx and over 80% of sulfur dioxide. So when we're thinking about how can this swapping out of clean energy sources for carbon also benefit air quality, um, we really expect a win-win. So we used a computer model um, to analyze this PM 2.5 over Madison. And the model that we used is simpler in many ways than some of the state-of-the-art tools, but it's the only tool available that lets us zoom in on our city and see how things are changing. Even you can see the isthmus where the concentrations of PM 2.5 are the highest. And as you move to the east and west sides, that um, the concentrations are a little lower. And then as you get further out from the downtown, they get lower and lower. Um, we've compared these with the two ground-based monitors. We have one on the west side and one on the east side, and the values line up um, quite um, closely. So it's not perfect, but it's the best we have right now. And our goal is to use this to answer what if questions. What if we swap out some of those sources to lower carbon and how can those also make our air healthier? So the first thing we wanted to do is to use this computer model to identify how, where the air pollution, this PM 2.5 pollution over Madison is coming from. And I am so excited about the plot that I'm showing you because it's really um, the first time that uh, we've done this kind of diagnosis for Madison. And really this kind of analysis is very unusual for any city. This might be the most rigorous urban scale analysis that any US city has had. And what we see here is that uh, about 30% of PM 2.5 in the air over Madison comes from the transportation sector. And that includes on-road, rail, and non-mobile sources like um, construction equipment. Uh, about a third, about 30%, um, comes from what are called point sources. And that includes both power plants, or what are sometimes called electricity generating units, and um, non-electricity point sources, like large factories. Then in the red, we have uh, what we call non-point sources, but that can be considered home heating and cooking, uh, including residential wood combustion. Uh, about 13% comes from agriculture, and then uh, the rest comes, about 10% comes from other land use, including agricultural fires and um, windblown dust. So you see, it's not a one-stop shop. There's a lot of different sources contributing to the health damaging pollution in the air that we're breathing. And if you start thinking about how these different swapping strategies could affect um, this, this pie chart, you can see that if we moved away from on-road transportation, that that's taking part of the chunk out. If we move toward cleaner, large point sources like electricity, that's cutting down the blue. And so different strategies address different pieces of the pie. So um, this work was funded by Madison Gas and Electric. And one of the th things that they were interested in is how have um, coal plant retirements across Wisconsin affected our air quality. And you know, the good news is that there's been a lot of coal plant retirements. Um, if you look at um, 2014, the dark uh, blue is nitrogen oxides, the lighter blue is sulfur dioxides. The green is fine particulate matter that's directly released. So if you ever look up at a power plant and actually see kind of a black smoke, that's the direct PM 2.5. But actually the NOx and the SOx both react in the atmosphere to create PM 2.5 as well. So different flavors of PM 2.5 and all of these emissions contribute. So between 20, 2014 and now, 2022, we've seen a big reduction in Wisconsin um, emissions from power plants. And there are more plants, uh, retirements planned going up to 2025. So we took this computer model and looked at the state of Wisconsin. And in panel A, you see the 2014 version of PM 2.5 across the state. And you can see the higher values 
um, in uh, cities like Madison and Milwaukee and Green Bay and Appleton. You also see higher values all up and down um, the Lake Michigan shoreline. Then in panel B, you see the percent change due to the coal-fired uh, closings that have already occurred. And in panel C, due to the closings that are planned um, in the next few years. And the little green dots, those are the retiring coal facilities. So you can see that the largest benefits um, from these retirements accrue in the eastern part of the state. That's not surprising because many of the green dots are in the eastern part of the state, um, but also the predominant wind patterns move from the west to the east. So some of the pollution that would have occurred would have been carried um, eastward from all sources. Um, we also looked at this idea of electric vehicles. So the coal-fired uh, retirements are already on the books, but electric vehicles is a trend that's increasing very rapidly across the United States. And many auto manufacturers have said that they're only going to start producing electric vehicles in the future. It's really hard to know what the future will look like with EVs. Um, and we didn't try to, we didn't have a crystal ball to figure out what number we should use. Instead, we picked some kind of edge of the envelope scenarios. Uh, what if 25% of our on-road light duty vehicles like cars and SUVs were replaced with plug-in electric vehicles? What if 50%? What if 100%? Let's just figure it out. We assumed um, that the electricity that would be um, supporting these electric vehicles came from non-emitting clean sources, which is consistent with MG&E's plan to move toward net zero emissions. Um, so sometimes when you're thinking about the environmental impact of electric vehicles, you say, well, you're taking the cars off the road, but you're adding in new electricity. And of course, then it depends what is that new electricity? Where, what, what kind of fuel are the power plants burning? And in this case, we assumed that it was um, non-emitting sources. So uh, one thing we did, and this is not so new, but just to kind of frame it out, is to think about what would these electric vehicle scenarios mean for carbon emissions? And we took the current 2014 as the reference case. And um, as you start cutting down the number of light duty vehicles, that's the green bar, as that goes down with the 25% and the 50% and finally the 100% case, where you have no gasoline or diesel uh, burning vehicles, the carbon emissions go way down. And the only thing we're left with are the heavy duty vehicles like um, buses and trucks. And there's been interest in electrifying those as well, um, but we didn't analyze those in our assessment. And so what we found is um, that when you start reducing the uh, emissions, uh, the, the on-road vehicles, then you see improvements in air. And so at the, the biggest benefits to PM 2.5, are coming from the 100% scenario, not surprisingly. And we're seeing the biggest improvements in the downtown and the isthmus where you have the most vehicles, the most population density, the most traffic. And we see that um, we can um, find up to a 10% reduction in the isthmus from the swapping of uh, gasoline for electric vehicles. And on the one hand, you say, well, that's only 10%. But remember that pie chart I showed you that really that there are so many different sources contributing to um, PM 2.5 over Madison that, you know, if we can be taking a chunk out of each one through individual strategies, that's taking us where we want to go. And I think that really the same uh, thinking is, is what we have to think about with carbon reductions. There is no silver bullet but there are a lot of solutions and each solution has benefits for both climate and clean air. So the um, 
uh, that we've spent a long time talking about the swapping, in part because that's sort of um, one of my favorite topics to think about and think about how we can um, address both air quality and climate goals. But that's really, of course, only part of the story. And we don't, um, most moms aren't buying new cars and, and ovens very frequently. So the swapping is something that we good to keep in mind when making a major purchase, but really um, our biggest um, toolbox when thinking about moms is their engagement and talking with their communities, talking with friends and family and engaging, and that will be point three, um, leaders. So this idea that, you know, the most important thing you can do to address climate change is to talk about it is really a powerful idea. And my friend, Catherine Hayhoe, one of the science moms, she um, has a TED, uh, a TED X talk or a TED talk, I'm not sure which, uh, where that's exactly the title. The most important thing you can do about climate is to talk about it. And, you know, here's uh, one of her quotes is this, no one does anything unless it feels important. And if no one is talking about it, how important can it be? So this idea that just talking about climate change is already moving the needle and a powerful way to take action, I think is, you know, surprising to some people, but really, really impactful. And so, there, but there's this question, how do you talk about climate change? And, you know, this is, again, one of the cool resources developed by the, the Science Moms uh, program, where they have this sort of four-step four method. First, you want to find a good starting point. Where is their common ground? How are you, you know, approaching a conversation with someone in a way that uh, builds receptivity? Um, one way to do that is to lead with feelings and, you know, trying to find something that you both care about. Um, land on solutions, because if something seems like a hopeless problem, it's very hard to, you know, engage, activate, and like think of this as an important solvable idea. And then, you know, be aware that not every conversation is going to lead to agreement, and that's okay. So, um, you know, we could talk about science communication for a really long time. It's such an interesting topic. Um, I've done a lot of working with communicating with lawmakers, with students, with um, you know, people in my personal life and a wide range of constituencies in uh, the public life. And really this idea of like finding this good way in is, is just understanding who you're talking to and what they care about. And, you know, they're giving some, uh, you know, examples of, did you just buy an induction stove or did you just switch to solar? You know, I often find it a lot more, um, uh, easy to talk about something like uh, what's going on with the weather and gosh, it's a hot day here in early May and uh, what a weird uh, cold uh, April we've had. Uh, here in Wisconsin, we all like to talk about the weather. So I think that oftentimes talking about the weather uh, is just one more example of a good way to get a conversation started. Um, this point about leading with um, the feelings, I think, is also uh, really good advice. We all ha so have so many shared values, especially when we're thinking about the future and our kids um, and, you know, worried about how to make the world a better place. And so I think in terms of thinking about how to get the conversation started, I think coming from this kind of heart space is uh, a good strategy that is also, you know, back to what I was saying about me having my kids and my work. When I'm at work, I'm very much in a headspace. But if I'm talking about, you know, uh, big decisions or how to how to, you know, make sure that my kids have a good day at school or, you know, how to think about making the future um, a, a world that they want to grow up in, you know, these are things that uh, resonate, I think, on a deeper level. Um, but you still want to have the facts. And, you know, when it comes to the facts on climate change, there's a lot of good resources to turn to. Um, the Science Moms website has lots and lots of resources in a, um, a very uh, digestible, accessible uh, format. Um, 
if you want to get a little wonkier, there are some amazing reports um, that have been put out by um, uh, scientific assessment processes here in Wisconsin. We have one called the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. At the national scale, we have um, the National Climate Assessment. And then at the global scale, there's something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So there's no shortage of facts on climate. I think that, you know, often there's a perception that there's a lot of dispute about the facts, but really uh, uh, studies have shown that over 99% of, sci of scientists agree on the basic facts about climate change. And this is really, you know, articulated in these um, assessment processes that bring together scientists from all over the world to, you know, hammer out what do we know with a high level of confidence? What do we know with a medium level of confidence? And what, you know, where are there the open questions? Scientists love open questions and knowing what we don't know. Um, but, but when it comes to climate change, we really know the facts. And finally, this idea of um, landing on solutions. And that brings us back to um, some of the, the um, to-do list and this idea that even just talking about it and taking action is something we can do. Um, uh, this idea of what to do when someone disagrees, you know, of course, we're not gonna agree on everything, um, but I think that, you know, listening to each other, talking things through, um, and, you know, understanding that there's a lot of layers to our perceptions and opinions on what to do about climate is uh, a great place to start. If you have to agree on everything, then it's hard to have a conversation. So the third thing on the to-do list, remember we had swap, we had share, and now is uh, speak up. And um, there's a lot of different ways to engage from uh, joining groups and engaging uh, with voting and writing letters. Um, but this is really where I often think about the Clean Air Act of 1970, because as a society, we have tackled air pollution and we are continuing to tackle it. We have put in place measures to solve the ozone hole problem. Like we have solved a lot of problems through effective policies. And this uh, image is of Boston in 1969, a particularly polluted day, but we would never see a day like this in Boston anymore, uh, unless maybe with a forest fire, but um, we would, you would never see the industrial plumes like you see here in this picture. Um, so this was 1969. In 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed. And since 1970, um, uh, emissions of the six pollutants regulated under the Clean Air Act as what are called criteria pollutants have come down by nearly 80%. And this has been as our economy has grown, we have more vehicles on the road, the population has grown, our energy consumption has grown, and unfortunately carbon dioxide has gone up as well. Because the clean air focuses on chemicals that can be taken out of tailpipes or smokestacks with technology. But there's no reason why we can't address carbon and these other pollutants at the same time. And I think that really the Clean Air Act, to me, is a message that we can do it. We've done it for lots of other pollutants. Now the question is just taking some of those same success strategies and applying them to climate. Um, I mentioned that um, the emissions had gone down. We can see that the air is getting cleaner. If we look at lots, no matter which of these pollutants we look at, they're all going down. Some especially fast, like sulfur dioxide, that blue line. Some a little bit more slowly, uh, like the green um, ozone line. And ozone is an especially big problem um, here in Wisconsin for some of our coastal communities. But, um, but really uh, across the board, air pollution has been getting uh, lower and lower across the United States and in Wisconsin. So we can see these um, reductions in air pollution from the ground. We can also see them from space. And this is where we circle back to one of the 
biggest projects that I'm involved in, which is leading the NASA team to make satellite data like you're looking at here, more relevant for public health and air quality planning. Uh, satellites that have been up in space for uh, decades or more and advanced ones are being launched almost every year can see gases and particles in the air even that we can't see with our eye. And what you're seeing here is nitrogen dioxide, which is emitted from almost all of the same sources as carbon dioxide. It only stays in the atmosphere for a couple of hours. And so you can see the, the fingerprints of the emissions very clearly with cities, power plants, even major roadways appearing in the satellite data. Now, this image was from 2005 uh, because the satellite was launched in 2004. But jump ahead to 2019, and you can see these very dramatic reductions in air pollution levels. Many cities had pollution levels go down by 40 to 50 percent. So these policies, even from the 1970s, are still working, and we can see the benefits from the ground and from space. So when I think about the Science Moms to-do list, I really see a lot of uh, good news uh, embedded here. First of all, that when we're the actions that we take to solve climate are the same actions we would take for cleaner air and healthier communities. And moms love to be efficient. Um, so it's nice to know that we uh, can solve many of these challenges all at the same time. There are many ways to share information and the sciencemoms.com has videos, Instagram posts, advice, answers, and many of the resources that I've shared in this talk. And finally, this idea of speaking up, this is not um, the first time we're trying to tackle major environmental challenges related to our air. And when it comes to uh, the pollutants under the Clean Air Act, when it comes to the ozone hole, we've solved big problems before. We can do it again, and everyone's voice matters, especially moms. And with that, I'll end with um, the to-do list and my own uh, reason for getting up in the morning and trying to make the world a better place. My little guy, Henry, and my big guy, uh, Peter, uh, who really um, are the, the fuel in my tank <laughs> or my electric charge as I move forward in my work. So thank you all so much. And I will address the lighting situation as well. Unmute. Thanks very much, Tracy. Uh, uh, we're sorry if we left you in the dark. Uh, and uh, we appreciate very much your uh, interesting and stimulating presentation. We've had a few comments in the chat. I uh, have to blame myself for uh, a few of them. Uh, and I hope that we'll get some more as uh, we're coming along. Uh, one of the issues that I wonder about is uh, we uh, who are environmentally concerned and, and often scientifically oriented, quote, as you did, the 90, sort of 99% scientific consensus on anthropogenic or human-induced global warming. But it seems that a lot of folk, especially conservative politicians, uh, dismiss expertise uh, in general and on this uh, issue in particular. What do we do? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I hear you. Uh, and, and I think, you know, different messages resonate for different audiences. I think that for, um, you know, moderate people who just want to understand what's going on, it's very helpful to know the 99% of scientists agree. I mean, and, uh, you know, kind of this thing of, you know, uh, if 99% of doctors thought that, you know, you should uh, uh, brush your teeth, then you know that's usually considered a pretty good thing to do. So uh, I think that depending on the audience, different messages play a different role. Um, you know, uh, one thing that I often talk about is trying to connect it back to people's personal lived experience. This idea that you know we fill up our gas tank with gasoline and you drive 
100 miles and then your gas tank is empty you know where did it go it went into the atmosphere and this idea that you know it was in your tank and now it's empty that is not uh, rocket science that's something that's very tangible and relatable and to recognize that once it's in the air uh it will stay there for decades or centuries and so um i think that you know to me you know my approach to communication is to try to connect things back to what people care about what they can relate to personally I think that there that this um, issue has become so charged and so political that at this point, you know, like many other issues in our society, from COVID vaccines to um, to well, I don't know, we can all, we can come up with a list of of all the the hot button issues, but I think climate has become uh, something that that people can kind of feel like it's an us versus them. Uh, topic. But that's one of the reasons why I really, you know, like the message of just talking about it. Because when people are hearing about uh, these issues from reasonable people who they relate to and care about, and that they can, you know, we're not saying policy X or policy Y is the way to go. We're just saying it's a problem and problems need solutions. One of the things that I found uh, makes people uh, gasp a little bit is if you point out that uh, uh, driving a Toyota Prius, which is quite an efficient uh, internal combustion engine powered vehicle, hybrid, uh, 7,500 miles uh, generates enough CO2 to be about the weight of the vehicle. <laughs> That's a good one. So, uh, and it was John Kutzbach actually who uh, prompted me to uh, do that little back of the envelope calculation. And let's see, we have some other uh, uh, chat coming in here. Um, the uh, uh, Sigrid uh, comments that it's uh, very disappointing that the conversation these days about the price of gas doesn't include the idea of using less to help mm -hmm. household budgets. Why aren't we suggesting carpooling, using buses and bikes? Uh, uh, with the war going on, uh, generally citizens would be asked to use less. Yeah, I think it's a it's a real good point, and um, and you know things are changing so rapidly that it's you know what's controlling the news and the public discourse can change um, month to month. But you know, I remember back about maybe 10 years ago, uh, gas prices at that point were also very, very high. And I was actually approached by one of our local taxi companies, Union Cab, because they were concerned about the price of gas and how it was affecting their operations. Um, at the time they drove uh, used police cars that they painted yellow and that those were their taxi cabs. And they were very interested in thinking about how can we move toward being a more uh, environmentally friendly company and save money on gasoline. So, you know, I think this idea that the more expensive gas prices can inspire um, uh, thinking about alternatives is, you know, this is just one example. And in that case, you know, there were a lot of options to consider. There's biofuels and there was propane and there was electric vehicles and hybrids. And um, so actually um, I helped connect them with a, a class at the UW, a group of graduate students who did an in-depth analysis. They surveyed the drivers, they surveyed the um, passengers, they analyzed the environmental footprint of, and cost of lots of different uh, vehicle types. And actually the student groups at the time then recommended uh, Toyota Priuses for Union Cab. And just to sort of visualize their idea, they took a Prius from some advertising and colored it yellow and added the Union Cab logos and, um, and really kind of visualized what this hypothetical future of cleaner vehicles could look like for our cab company. And um, I had that poster in my office for uh, for a number of years. And then one day I looked out on the street 
And there was a yellow Prius with all of the Union Cab markings because now Union Cab drives mostly uh, yellow Priuses. And that was really inspired in part by the student's analysis. Now, that is a dated technology is changing. You know, the students might do a different analysis if they did it today than 10 years ago. But I think the basic idea that these, that these um, things that are changing, whether it's new technologies or old technologies becoming more expensive or less attractive, um, are moving the needle in helping organizations think about doing things differently. Uh, someone with a famous, famous name in our community, Gisela Kutzbach, asks, what percentage of the general population is affected by PM 2.5 and what levels of PM 2.5? And she notes that uh, our cell phones, uh, can, our smartphones can give us info about air quality, for example. Yes. So I would say 100% of the population is affected by PM 2.5 uh, because uh, even at low levels, it, there are some health effects, and but also the, the levels change day to day. Even very pristine areas, like in the Western United States, can have extremely high PM 2.5 levels with forest fires uh, or windblown dust or dust storms. And actually, PM 2.5 levels around the world um, uh, are um, can be very, very high. And often, even countries that have lower levels of industrialization have much higher levels of PM 2.5 from, um, from on-road vehicles or wood burning for cooking and heating or whatever. So actually relative to most of the world, the PM 2.5 levels here in the US are quite low. We have some of the cleanest air in the world because of the um, regulations and technology developed uh, with the Clean Air Act as the the push. Um, this point that it varies day to day, and you can see it on your iPhone. Um, this is a new development because one of the challenges in thinking about what is the PM 2.5 in the air is that um, we don't have monitors everywhere. Uh, in fact, about only about a third of U.S. counties have monitors, and many countries don't have a single monitor in the whole country. So on the one hand, you know, we could uh, say, gosh, it would be great to have lots of monitors here in Madison, and it would. On the other hand, um, there has to be strategies for sort of filling in the blanks in between the monitors that we have. And one such strategy are computer models, like I showed you in my presentation. Another strategy is satellite data, uh, which doesn't see particulate matter directly, but can be used to deduce what's in the air. And actually more and more computer models ground measurements, and satellite data are being fused together to create kind of a best available uh, recipe of, um, of estimating what people are breathing around the world. And so in fact, the, um, the information you get on your smartphone comes from this kind of fused data product. Um, iPhones use data from a um, company called Breezometer, which is a uh, startup company based out of Israel. And they provide the global data from their global fused data analysis. So this is really now, you know, exactly what I do with the team for NASA, because we're trying to, you know, amplify these efforts and move them forward to try to make satellite data useful for a wide range of products. And I'm excited to say, actually, the Breezometer team from our iPhones is coming to um, the next meeting of my NASA team, which will take place in about two weeks in Houston. Tom appreciates uh, uh, a number of aspects of your uh, presentation tonight. Uh, notes that we all have moms and the use of that as a basis for activism uh, seems attractive. Uh, and also the linking back as you have to things like the Clean Air Act, successes of good policy, uh, seems like a powerful tool. Uh, and he asks, how much of the solution is simply convincing people that there's hope? You know, that is a really good uh, question, Tom. And I think that, you know, I've gotten into uh, 
conversations with other atmospheric scientists, climate experts, what have you, where there's the question, is it better to convince people that there's a problem or is it better to talk about the solutions? And, you know, once I was even on a panel where there was, they were debating whether we should ever even use the word solution uh, in the context of climate change, because uh, at this point we are locked into a lot of changes that are coming down the pike, whether we like it or not. Uh, but to me, you know, I'm an optimist and I feel like if you don't use the word solution, that just seems uh, really hard to convince somebody to take action on something that seems hopeless. So, you know, I think one thing that is uh, at least the way that the system is working is that there are a lot of different messengers and a lot of different narratives. And, you know, some people may be most convinced if they know more about the problem and other people more about what they can do. I really like that the Science Moms program with their outreach, with our outreach, is really focusing on the solution-oriented aspect of this because I think that we, you know, we all want to make the world a better place. We all want to leave the world better for our kids. You know, think of all we're doing now from saving for college funds to making sure they get all their immunizations and vitamins. I mean, we're doing so much to make the world a better place for our kids in the future. And, you know, I think a lot of uh, parents, non-parents, moms, dads, grandparents, you know, want to say, well, what, tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll, I will feed them the right foods. I will get them the right vitamins and I will uh, take the steps that are needed to take. But if nobody's saying what the solution pathway is, then it's hard to, you know, activate all that goodwill that I think is really out there. Okay. I want to try to hit a couple more questions before we, we wrap up. Uh, Vern uh, asks, what are your thoughts on bridging the gap from the clean energy that's available and the amount needed to do a full swap? And he comments that what's going on in Europe is uh, but an example. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, there's the availability and I don't think that's a problem. I think really it's a cost problem because uh, power plants last for about 50 years. So when is the right time to retire power plants? When is the right time to invest in uh, new technologies? I, you know, I think that um, lots of studies have been shown that, uh, you know, uh, solar panels, the size of whatever can provide enough electricity to meet the whole United States needs. I mean, the availability theoretically is there. I think though the, the cost and the technology to integrate that in with our uh, current lifestyle, there's, there's a transition pathway. There's no question about it. And it's not, there's no one easy answer. So I'm not going to pretend that there is. We were just talking before this, um, uh, uh, before we went public altogether about the, you know, nuclear engineering department here at Wisconsin. Uh, we have a solar program here at Wisconsin. We have a, one of the largest biofuels research centers here at Wisconsin. You know, a lot of folks working on better wind turbines. You know, it's really one of these things where there's a lot of solutions available in different countries, different states will lean on different solutions for in different ways. But I think that, you know, the, the, framework to say that, you know, electricity, we can get from many, many different clean sources. And much of our energy use could be moved toward electricity from transportation to maybe even home heating. So uh, to me, this idea that like there are pathways, uh, what is the timeline? What is the cost? Uh, you know, I think it's certainly a better story today than it would have been 20 years ago. And actually one of my colleagues, Greg Nemet, uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago called How Did Solar Get So Cheap? Um, where he was really tracing like what, how do we explain the rapid decline in um, solar power prices, which is great news. And what can we learn about that for other technologies from storage to wind to, you know, transmission. So I think that, um, that, it's, it's not a one-stop shop answer, but I think there are a lot of answers out there. I'll just add my own 
comment that I, I think issue number one is decarbonizing electricity. Yeah. Uh, because uh, as you have alluded to, that enables many other uh, possibilities. Um, yep. Ashley Becker, who is a UM, uh, UW grad student and uh, very active at Bethel, asks, do you talk about climate change with your kids? Uh, particularly your oldest, and if so, what do you share? Yeah, I do talk about climate change with Peter. Uh, he is very interested in what's going on with the world and how we're tackling uh, different problems. And, you know, I certainly try to focus on this solutions-oriented, positive perspective. Uh, one thing I hear sometimes is like, gosh, this is going to be a big problem for the next generation to solve. And I think one message that I say to Peter and that I say on a regular basis, so I'll say it here, is that I don't think that this is a problem for our kids to solve. Like, it's we're the grown-ups. It's on our shoulders. We should be solving it. And so, you know, I try to let him know that in my work, uh, I am doing the best I can to uh, address problems, to work with um, organizations that are making change, to you know, train uh, the young men and women that are at the university that are about to go out and become part of the workforce. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not expecting this to be a problem that he has to uh, feel is weighing on his future. Uh, but I want him to know that, you know, it is a challenge. And, you know, my family, we have one Prius, and then when we needed a new car, we, um, our second car is an electric vehicle and, you know, kind of explaining to him, why did we do that? And, you know, we're certainly not, we're, there's other things we do, you know, right now we have our air conditioning going cause it's pretty warm. Um, but, you know, making it clear that when we have the air conditioning going, you know, you want to make sure to have the windows shut so that you're not wasting any uh, electricity and making it clear, like why we're doing this. It's not just because my mom told me to, but because there's a real reason behind it. Uh, one last question, I think, uh, before we close. Uh, Wilda as, uh, as comments that you mentioned that suburban moms are a central target for uh, the science moms effort. Is there a particular segment of that audience that is most receptive to your message or least receptive and any predictors of who fits in those categories? Yeah, so... Um... A lot of the uh, approach of the Science Moms Initiative is based on research out of Yale University. And they have a framework that they call the Six Americas framework. And it basically breaks down the population. I forget the exact terminology that they use, but basically there's the people who are extremely concerned with climate change already. And then there's the people who are actively uh, opposing or doubting or dismissing um, science, sort of the, the edge of the, the bell-shaped curve. And, you know, neither of those audiences is the target audience here. Um, but some of these in-between uh, more moderate communities uh, are really the, the majority of people fall in the middle. And I think that that's who we're trying to reach. Now, how you know who's in the different categories, actually, they are the, the um, advertising professionals behind this program are uh, running focus groups and when they develop uh, content, add content, they run it by um, uh, study groups to assess how it performs and decide which ones are worthy of being buying at TV ad time or you know internet ad time uh, to run. So they have uh, some secret sauce that they use to figure out how, which, which messages to put out um, but they run everything by the, the science moms. And if there's ever anything that they're putting out that we feel is not um, uh, appropriate or legitimate, then you know, certainly we, we um, make that known. Well, we've pretty much reached the end of our uh, normal time. Uh, and uh, before pe uh, people leave, it's important to thank everyone, those who have joined us for this event, especially those who have submitted questions and comments. We hope everyone's found this time interesting and informative. I know that I certainly have. Special thanks to Tracy Holloway, our guest speaker, 
and to Ashley Becker and Rob Kohlhepp for their behind the scenes technical support for our session. If someone you know would have liked to view today's event but couldn't, it's been recorded and will soon be on the Caring for Creation webpage on Bethel's website. This is the last of our Caring for Creation webinars for the spring term, so stay tuned to see what the fall will bring. And until, until then, good night and may good health and the peace of God be with us all. <laughs>